Hi, and welcome to this uh, next session of Powbox Secure. I'm Rick Kuohara, COO and Chief Compliance Officer of Powbox. And I'm really happy to have with me today, Carrie Nixon, co-founder and managing partner of Nixon Guilt Law and Michael Parisi, uh, VP of Assurance Strategy and Community Development at High Trust. And we're here to talk about regulation and innovation in healthcare. Um, as we know, it doesn't always go together nicely, but um, I think this will be a great conversation to see um, how things are, where we are now and how things are heading. Um, before we get started, um, if you have any questions, please throw it in that session Q&A um, in the chat next to the screen, um, and we'll be go ahead and address them at the end. If for some reason we don't get to those questions, um, then we will um, do a follow-up email with you guys. We'll get a written response from Mike and Carrie and get that over to everybody after the conference. Um, but before we get started, maybe Carrie and Mike, if you don't mind doing a short introduction about yourself. Sure, I'll start. This, um, I'm Carrie Nixon. Um, as Rick said, I am with Nixon Gwilt Law, and we are a law firm that specializes uh, specifically or focuses specifically on healthcare innovation. So we serve uh, a lot of digital health companies, including uh, telehealth and remote patient monitoring companies, and have experienced um, a lot with all of the uh, changes to regulations coming down uh, from, from CMS during this time. Great, and thanks, I'm Carrie. This is my Sorry, I'm, I'm located just outside of Washington, D.C., in case you all are wondering where I'm coming to you from. There you go. Yeah, so Mike Parisi, uh, Vice President of Strategy and Community Development at High Trust, and we are a globally recognized standards organization in the security and privacy space. And our programs allow organizations to provide assurances around security and privacy to their relevant stakeholders. So I'm very happy to be here today and have the discussion. Great, thanks, Carrie and Mike. Um, so to kick things off right away, um, obviously the pandemic has um, affected a lot of people and a lot of industries in a negative way. But you know, kind of on the flip side, um, healthcare has um, it, it may have actually helped healthcare a little bit uh, adopt with technology. Um, how have you guys seen healthcare adjust to the pandemic? Um, despite being in a heavily regulated industry. Um, Carrie, do you want to start? Sure. I really think and hope that we are at a turning point for digital health in this country. Um, we have seen firsthand now the, the sort of effects of being caught flat-footed, right? Where uh, we have a lot of technologies and digital health innovations available to us but sometimes our regulatory infrastructure is well behind and it's not a at a point to, uh, to support some of those technologies. You know, in the, ca in the case of telehealth, this technology had been in existence for a long time, but uh, it really um, had not been widely adopted because of the reimbursement policy and, and legislation that was in place with respect to Medicare patients. And, um, you know, we know that things that don't get paid for in healthcare tend not to get done. So when we were faced with COVID and faced with the challenge of getting virtual care services uh, to many, many people who would not be able to go into their doctor's office, this was uh, this was a real um, a real kick in the kick in the pants to sort of get moving on allowing things like telehealth and remote patient monitoring to be used in a much more um, uh, broad manner and in fact to be reimbursed in a broad manner. So we saw in March and April CMS come out with a number of um, with two interim rules that made changes to the, uh, to the telehealth policy and specifically announced a waiver of the requirement that telehealth could only be reimbursed for Medicare patients if it was uh, provided in, to a patient who, is, who lives in a, in a rural area. And if that patient went to what they called an originating site, such as a rural health clinic, to actually receive the telehealth services from another provider. They, you know, they, that was obviously very, very limiting to, uh, to patients. And so CMS was able to waive 
uh, that requirement during COVID. And we are very hopeful that, um, you know, that this will be a lasting change that we will see in, in telehealth. Um, many more, uh, you know, changes that I could point to, but that is, is sort of a primary and foundational example. Mike, and what, do you, what did you kind of see? Yeah, we saw um, we saw a lot of interesting things, and some of which related to what Carrie did just pointed out. You know, everything from uh, the regulators themselves, I think, uh, communicating or, or exercising some flexibility relative to a number of the regulations in the HIPAA space, right? So HHS and, and OCR. You know, what, what's interesting is I think it's forced. Um, not only the regulators, although I don't know that they would admit this just yet, um, but certainly organizations to think about this concept of relevancy as it relates to uh, security and privacy posture and regulations more broadly um, in you know situations like this, right? So when you look at some of the things that are in place that are impacting the healthcare industry from a regulatory perspective, they're, they're really very burdensome, and, and some of them are, are almost barriers for organizations to operate within an environment uh, that we're in now, right? And some of the things that Carrie had mentioned, especially health tech organizations and, and telehealth organizations. So instead of, as, as we know, last time I looked, um, our, our regulators don't, don't move at lightning speed. So instead of being able to change and, and alter those regulations to allow for that, they basically had, had to put it on hold, right? Um, this is one thing that, that, that we saw. In addition to that, you know, healthcare organizations themselves having to adjust to obviously you know, work, working remotely, um, I think that that was mixed, um, mixed outcomes, right? So you had some organizations that were able to shift very quickly because they were probably already piloting or utilizing some of the solutions from companies like that, that carries some organization helps and it made it quite easy and probably easier than they thought where others they needed to actually stand up you know, new operations new programs new infrastructure etc the other thing that that we saw and the last thing that i'll mention is an adjusting this concept of third-party risk management really two different ways um, one, the traditional battleship speed of trying to onboard new vendors and third parties into healthcare organizations um, had to go away, right? I mean, when you think about your hospital systems and individuals on the front lines, they needed to work with new business partners, new third parties, get PP in the door, the stand-up tents within parking lots, right, and putting them through this rigorous process of five or six months security and privacy review before allowing them into the organization just could not happen. So you saw many organizations forgoing that so they can quickly get them in the door without necessarily a comprehensive vetting and hoping that they're going to pick that up on the back end. And now I think we're seeing organizations rethink that process and how can they rely on different levels of assurance to onboard new business partners quicker to adjust for situations like this. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, and it kind of it kind of goes to the next question. And Mike, maybe you can start with this. But how do you kind of balance good security and privacy um, with without stifling innovation? Yeah, I think um, I think that's an, an age old issue, not just within healthcare. You know, I, I would call it an, an industry agnostic issue. Uh, but especially with, within healthcare, when when we talk about healthcare, I think a, a lot of individuals still have a tendency um, when when they hear healthcare to think about just covered entities, for example, right? So hospital systems and health plans, and you know maybe some of the players within that space. But I would argue any organization can be a healthcare organization or operating within the healthcare continuum. And as Carrie mentioned before, you know, a lot of the organizations that we now work with and helping them understand how to balance security and privacy um, are those innovative organizations, which is why we've designed programs that are specifically focused on those types of organizations, such as, Rick, I know you're intimately familiar with our Right Start program. Uh, Pawbox was the very first organization to go through that. Um, and, and we're really trying to help them understand 
know, as you build good security and privacy into the foundational components of that organization right out of the gate, it becomes easier to have your innovative solutions adopted by stakeholders with, within the marketplace. And it, it's a very critical balance. And I would tell you, organizations like ourselves, the standards organizations, understand the need to balance security and privacy with innovation. However, unfortunately, our regulators are, are lagging behind, right? And they need to, to catch up and, and understand how they adopt uh, their, their programs and their requirements to allow for innovation to continue as well. I'm sure Carrie's got something to add there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. It is the case that we are going to have to figure out how to successfully regulate for privacy protections while not stifling innovation, because it is, it is not the case that uh, some of these waivers, for example, that you know, during the COVID public health emergency, uh, you know, providers can use a you know, non-HIPAA compliant platform for providing virtual care. That's not something that CMS and OIG are going to keep in place, right? I mean, that, you know, it is in everyone's long-term interest that we have very significant privacy protections for patient data. So this is a nut that we, we have to crack. And, you know, part of the way that we might think about doing that is making sure that we are walk, working across the entire ecosystem, uh, the regulatory Eco ecosystem and some of the organizations like High Trust, right, to, to get them sort of involved um, with this as well. It is often the case in my experience that uh, agencies, you know, two agencies that both are under the Department of Health and Human Services do not coordinate with each other when it comes to things, um, to, to policy decisions, right, whether it's on reimbursement or whether it's on privacy and, and security. Um, so for example, you know, FDA and CMS do not usually, do, do not typically coordinate uh, real well when it comes to reimbursing virtual care technologies, right, or devices. Um, and, and perhaps, um, you know, even how they think about FDA, even how FDA thinks about privacy with respect to some of these devices. So that is something that, that we really have to um, have to address, I think, as we move forward. Hey, Rick, can I add a follow on comment there? I, I have to because Carrie okay. nailed it and she nailed it and really, really struck, struck a chord there. Um, and what got me thinking was was CMS. So to round this out, and, and I talked about relevancy um, before, and, and I think it's very important here because when you look at a lot of the standards and, and requirements that are quite archaic, uh, that, that some of these regulators still have in place, and CMS is, is probably the largest offender of this. They're asking organizations to provide security and privacy assurances over a set of standards or requirements that when you think about these innovative organizations and, and with the onset of technology and, and the cloud, aren't relevant anymore. Um, and a lot of these innovative organizations that, that are coming out today, they're trying to provide the same level of security and privacy, but they're doing it differently. Right? They're not doing it the old way. And the way that they are now doing it makes it more seamless for the, the users right, of, of those solutions. Um, and it's probably even more secure. So if we could get some of the regulators to get their heads out of the sand, frankly, and understand this concept of relevancy, which is what we do with, with our framework, as Carrie mentioned, we're constantly updating it and changing it and removing things that don't make sense anymore. And we look to these innovative organizations for what I refer to as alternate security and privacy implementations to come to us to say, hey, we figured out a better way right and we figured out a more seamless way and it's just as secure if not better and i think paul box is a great example right of somebody that, that that's done that um and and there's so many others out there so i just wanted to put that in there again this concept of relevancy um, re really needs to stay at, at the forefront of what we're doing to balance this 
Absolutely. Yeah. And it kind of, it strikes me, you know, how you're, you're talking about it is you know, getting everybody talking together and getting on the same page. Um, you know, Carrie, I, with your experience on the Hill or, you know, um, just in that environment, or even Mike, you can chime in here too. Are you seeing, are there discussions going back and forth? You know, how, how are people able to work with the regulators to say, you know, like you said, Mike, hey, these, this is the reality now, you know, how can we get this updated? I know that there's a few, you know, groups that are formed, um, but how's that, is that conversation happening? You know, how's it going forward? You know, kind of where are we at with that? Yeah, so I'll start out. When it, when it comes to telehealth specifically, it's not just the regulators we're dealing with. Uh, telehealth reimbursement for Medicare patients, which is a, an enormous part of our uh, healthcare system, um, is actually regulated by, well, is actually governed by Section 1834M of the Social Security Act that was passed, I believe, back in 1997. And it was during that time in 1997 when Congress decided to the conditions under which telehealth would be reimbursed for Medicare. And those conditions were you have to be located in a rural or, or geographically underserved area, and you have to go to an originating site in order to receive telehealth. So this, so if you think about this, right, you have uh, in a rural area, um, patients are not likely to have access to the same kind of specialists if they were and they were in, in the big city. So this was really, this legislation really evolved to allow uh, people in rural areas to go to their rural health clinic and connect to, on the other end, to a hospital or health system, to a specialist maybe located in a, in a city three or four hours away. And it hasn't changed since that, right? So, so since then, and, and it's crazy. Um, you know, the technology has for telehealth has evolved so that it's extremely easy to have uh, access to it uh, in your home if indeed you have broadband and we can, we can put that uh, aside uh, for a moment as, as another issue maybe we, we touch on. But it's even easy to have, you know, uh, devices, connected devices in your home. Um, where, you know, that can be helpful um, in a telehealth visit um, and certainly in remote patient monitoring. So Congress is sort of the first barrier uh, in the way in terms of um, removing the legislative barriers to reimbursement for telehealth. Um, and hopefully they will do so. Uh, here, we, there have been a couple of hearings on the Hill during COVID and um, one in the House and one in the Senate, uh, at least, maybe a couple more. And there has been bipartisan support for expanding telehealth and virtual care services. Um, that's really good news in the hearing, but it actually doesn't mean a whole lot unless they actually get to work and, and pass the legislation. And, and as everyone may have noticed, Congress does not seem particularly uh, eager to, to coordinate or collaborate on passing anything these days. So, you know, hope, maybe we wait post-election. When it comes to CMS, um, I was pleased to see during COVID the outreach that CMS made to organizations like the Connected Health Initiative and the American Telemedicine Association and uh, the Su Consumer Technology Association to get their feedback on, on, on what was needed, right? And what, what constraints need to be loosened. I think that if that feedback were sought on a more regular basis, um, and if those, you know, if interactions with sort of on the ground stakeholders happened more with the policymakers at CMS, I think we would move a bit faster, um, hopefully in, in the right direction. Um, there has got to be an understanding on the part of the policymakers in CMS and at FDA as to how these things are actually used and implemented on the ground with patients and with providers. So I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, I would. Um, I agree with everything that Carrie said, and I'm I'm not a lawyer, 
but 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 she is. I mean, she knows the 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 details of all all the regulations um, what more so than I do. But you know, a couple things to, to hinge upon that that, that Carrie mentioned. Um, you know, and especially that that last piece. And again, I'm going back to not only relevancy but adaptability. And there's a lot of misalignment between what the regulators and you know their their high towers think organizations should be able to do. Um, however, with a lot of these solutions, it may be impossible to to implement. Right. And then you get to this discussion around, well, is that is that really necessary? And I think we've seen a shift in a lot of the standards and regulations, especially in, in recent years, where they're written in such a way that they are so broad and subject to so much interpretation that you end up with inconsistent application. And the, the challenge there is, uh, the spirit of what they're trying to support, which I'm totally behind, right? Protecting people's personal information kind of gets lost along the way. So one of the, some of the things that we're doing and that we're seeing some, some positive reception from a lot of the regulators is I'm um, having a discussion around how do you tell the story of how an organization is meeting uh, the spirit of what they're telling them they need to have in place and them being more receptive to that story, because there's there's more than one way to address uh, the regulations and, and the requirements that exist across many of these standards. So educating them, and we understand you know, what it is that you're trying to achieve, but you need to be open to different ways in order to address that, I and mean, not be so draconian when it comes to the enforcement side of the house. And, OCR is probably the, the best e example of that um, in recent years. I mean, it's really a, a luck of the draw or a roll of the dice, depending upon which regulator you get in what region, or what your outcomes could be. Um, and it really shouldn't be that way. So if we're trying to enforce consistency around application, we need to enforce, enforce consistency around interpretation and also enforcement. And that's a lot of the discussions that, that we've been having. And also pushing these organizations to understand accepting certain levels of assurance or certain third-party assurance reports that do, in fact, align to their standards is something that they should be doing more. Um, and it's only going to make their jobs easier and make the entities that are implementing standards and ensuring they're enforcing those standards themselves. It's going to make their job a lot easier as well. Um, so those, those are some of the things that I'm seeing and, and that we're doing as well. Yeah, and I'll just add real quick that, you know, these regulators have to kind of walk a fine line, right? I mean, they, they on the one hand, they need to create regulations that are broad enough so that they don't inadvertently um, disincentivize uh, an innovative use of something or an innovative product um, because they've thought too narrowly, right? So, so you could you could easily see a situation whereby CMS might regulate uh, around something in a way that has not yet imagined a use case that could be done a little bit differently just a year down the road. So. By the same token, so they so it's got to be broad enough to allow for some innovation. By the same token, CMS has also, and all of the regulators have, you know, put the fear of God into physicians and companies who um, create these products and and use them. Um, they are terrified of, you know, picking, getting, having the wrong regulator, right, come and visit them from OCR, uh, as as Michael just just mentioned. And um, they're terrified of, you know, both, uh, you know, some of the, the, the very steep, you know, privacy, um, um, uh, you know, ramifications if, if, if they, and fines, if they, you know, have a privacy breach, they're very concerned about running, inadvertently running afoul of the fraud and abuse laws. And it would be nice. Um, so it would be nice if, if CMS and the FDA and, and regulators as a whole kind of said, hey, everyone, you know, we are leaving this 
Um, we're leaving this open to an extent. So we want to allow you to innovate and figure out what works best, but by the same token, you know, don't abuse it, right? And that's, I think, the message sort of that needs to get across because you have, um, you know, both healthcare providers and companies that want to do the right thing, but are really afraid of getting something wrong inadvertently. And then on the other hand, you have the bad actors that, that somehow we have to protect against. So it's, it's kind of a fine line. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie and Mike. I think, you know, that kind of nicely segues us into this, the last five minutes we have here. Um, do you see a point in the near future where, you know, there will be alignment and that balance between um, regulation and innovation? I can go first um, and then and then hand it to, to Carrie. So um, I think two two words in that question stand out and make it interesting to answer, which is near. Um, I, I do think there will be a future. I guess it defines, you know, it depends on how we define near. Um, and then alignment, <laughs> which is probably the crux of, of the entire discussion point, right? So you know what's what's interesting. I'll I'll throw out a, a few thoughts. Um, this alignment between balancing regulation and innovation. I think we see pockets of that, right? Regardless of the pandemic, I think we we were already starting to to see that, and I think we actually see it more so on the statutory side than we do on the federal side, right? So unfortunately, we have every state that's creating their own security and privacy um, authority and regulation. It's going to happen. So when we talk about in the near future, I could see a point that within the next 12 to 14 months, I won't say the E word that is the election, it depends on that, but within the next 12 to 14 months, I could see every state having their own security and privacy standard regulation and, and authority in, in place. Now, will a lot of those look very similar? Yes, I do believe a lot of them will, will look very similar. Um, are a lot of those now being developed in conjunction with um, in innovative organizations? Yes. Were they before? No, not necessarily. I mean, if you look at CCPA and if you talk to so some of the thought leaders that were focused on developing CCPA, they will explicitly tell you they developed that standard to go after the tech companies. They didn't develop that, develop that in conjunction with the tech companies. A very good friend of mine was an advisor uh, for the group that created CCPA. And we were at another conference some, some months ago, back when we used to be able to do those things in person. Um, you know, having, having a cocktail. And, and he said the, the number one reason why California sought out to develop CCPA was to go after Facebook, hands down, right? So a lot of those activities in the past, I don't think there was an alignment. And now you're starting to see more collaboration between the innovators and those that are trying to establish regulation because it's just good business to say, look, what can you do? This is what we would like you to do. What can you put in place? I and mean, let's work together on a solution to provide assurances. And you avoid this, you know, blaming the, the other around, well, they put something in place that we couldn't meet. Or, well, they're not willing to meet what we put in place. And so more of that alignment is happening. And I think a lot of it is coming from, and I'd be interesting to hear Carrie's perspective on this, I think a lot of this is coming from innovative organizations being proactive, right, and approaching um, how they are establishing good security and privacy posture, as opposed to well, let's not talk about it unless somebody asks us because we're afraid if somebody does ask us, we're seeing a shift of organizations using that to be a differentiator and be a thought leader and a market leader to say, look, we've got this nailed and let us work with you to explain how we've addressed it so there is more alignment um, between regulation and innovation. Do I think, Rick, that's going to happen within the next 14 months? 
No, but we're seeing pockets of it for sure. Yeah, and a good example of that, not necessarily specifically related to privacy and security, um, is uh, artificial intelligence and in healthcare, AI and healthcare. Um, some of the stakeholder groups, Consumer Technology Association, uh, uh, Connected Health Initiative and others, uh, have been very proactive, as you mentioned, in coming up with um, an agreed upon uh, set of terminology and definitions that goes along with that terminology, right? We know that it's important that everyone be speaking the same language when, um, when regulations are being developed or when policy is being developed. So what machine learning may mean to one person uh, in one agency may not be what machine learning means to another person in another agency. And so, you know, it is, I am seeing groups proactively try to get at that problem um, and, and, you know, proactively saying to the policymakers, here is the set of things that we think you need to be aware of when you're making policy around that. Here's how all of us are talking about it. Um, and utilizing it. So it would be really helpful if, if you, you know, looked, looked to this. Um, with respect to, you know, privacy and, and security and sort of innovation in general going forward, um, you know, I agree, it's gonna be, it's not gonna happen overnight um, in, on, a, on a more permanent basis for sure. Um, you know, the, the FDA just announced a center for center of excellence for digital health. That's great. That's great. But it doesn't coordinate or collaborate actively with CMS or with ONC, right? And that's, that's disappointing, frankly. That's really disappointing. Um, you know, I, I really hope that we will see more attention to that type of collaboration because they, every, you know, they, it, the regulations really need to work together. Thanks, Kerry. And, you know, thank you both. Um, we were a little bit over. So, you know, if there are any questions that we picked up, we'll send that to you guys for a written response and we'll send that out to um, everyone post-conference. But um, Kerry and Mike, thank you again so much for being with us today. Really appreciate your time. We told you we could talk Thank on you. this one day. <laughs> we'll, we'll try and get together again. Maybe we can do this in a, in a webinar or something and, and talk more. All right. Thanks, Rick. Sounds good. Bye, Michael. Thank you. Bye. Bye.